let's get started. Um, hello and welcome all financial aid officers on the call today. Um, my name's Olivia. I am an event planner here at SoFi. Um, and excited to introduce our speaker for today, Liz Young, who is the head of investment here at SoFi. Um, and again, as Liz previous met, previously mentioned, if there's any questions throughout the um, the call that you'd like to answer, please put it in the um, Q and A and um, or the chat box, and then we will get to them um, towards the end of our call so we can answer and address any questions. So Liz, I will hand everything off to you. Great, thanks, Olivia. Hi, everybody. Uh, I am going to share my screen with a presentation on it so that I can show you all kinds of pictures while we do this because that is more interesting to watch <laughs> than just watching me talk. So um, what we are gonna cover today is basically uh, okay, I think we're good, uh, is basically everything inflation related. And I'm going to go through a history of inflation. I'm going to talk about how it's affecting things today. I'm going to talk about different measures of inflation. And I urge you to ask questions. And like Olivia said, put them in the Q&A box. We can cover those towards the end. I only really planned to talk at you for about 25 minutes or so. Nobody wants to listen to me much longer than that, um, but we are going to cover a lot of stuff. So as we go through, just feel free to, to shoot questions in there um, and we'll get to them as, as best we can at the end of it. Okay, so uh, we can also talk about an economic outlook if that's interesting to people. Um, but the way that I thought we would start this, I actually really, really love this chart. This is a very long-term chart. So this goes back to the 1970s, early 1970s. Uh, and if you remember what happened, even if you weren't around in the 1970s, I was not around in the 1970s, but I've read about wow. it. I've seen a lot of numbers about it and um, gotten a history lesson myself about it. So this goes back to the 70s. What we're showing you here is basically a history of how things have unfolded as far as the Federal Reserve is concerned, uh, inflation targeting, because I think in today's age, it's really easy for us to assume that it's always been this way, where we've always had a 2% inflation target. We've always had a Fed that told us exactly what they were gonna do. Uh, and we've always had press conferences, when in fact, that is absolutely not the case. So back to the 70s, the blue line that you're seeing here is core PCE. And I'll explain why we are uh, looking at that instead of the typical CPI, but core PCE inflation is the blue line. And then that peachy line is the Fed funds rate, the upper bound. So the range right now is 0 0.25 to 0.5. What we'd be showing you on that peachy line is 0.5. Okay. So if you look back to the 70s, some of these little blurbs here, price stability and max employment mandates enshrined by Congress. That is actually when it started. That's when the Fed was given their mandates. So the Fed has a dual mandate. And I think that a lot of this is really important to talk about, especially today, the Fed is meeting right now as we speak, I would give anything to be a fly on that wall, but we're gonna hear from them tomorrow and they are gonna tell us what their decision is for the May meeting. Everybody's expecting it to be a 50 basis points hike. But back in the, the mid 70s is when Congress decided that the Fed's mandate should be maximum employment and price stability. So that's what we're always talking about when we talk about the dual mandate of the Fed and their two pronged approach. So right now we're in a situation where we have absolutely max employment, maybe even beyond max employment because we have more open jobs than we do unemployed people. So that box is checked and that is a lot of what has given the fed the freedom uh, to tighten monetary policy to talk about tightening monetary policy to be so hawkish in their comments because the labor market is so tight so that's when that all started and then you fast forward a little bit and you see fed funds rate targeting likely began can't really nail down an exact date for this but that's when so we're looking at about 19 late 1982 early 1983 when rate targeting likely began. What we mean by that is thinking about uh, right now, it's obviously a 2% inflation target. They never disclosed it back then. They didn't tell us what the targeting was, but that's likely when they started to discuss it as, okay, this is what we would like our inflation target to be. So when they spoke behind closed doors at the Federal Reserve, they knew that they were roughly targeting a certain level. 
Okay, we've also shaded recessions in here. That's what those gray bars are back there. So now we've covered basically that decade from 1970 to 1980 and then a little bit into the 80s. And look at how high, first of all, core PCE inflation was. That's something that I think is really important um, to remember looking at, we're looking at the left-hand side for that. And then look at how high the Fed funds rate was. Also crazy, right? Those are times that, first of all, many of us don't remember, or maybe we weren't even alive for, but right now we're talking about being afraid of a 50 basis point hike when we had a Fed funds rate that was above 15% back in the 80s. So desperate times back then we may be in a tough time now but it's not like it was then we have a lot more transparency now than we did back then okay so then fast forward a little bit more look at informal inflation target of about two percent was agreed upon behind closed doors okay that was not until the mid 90s when we had that two percent target that was introduced and then fast forward even further Fed holds first ever post-meeting press conference, not until the mid 2010, the early 2010s, okay? So although it seems like we're just, we're almost entitled to this transparency, we're entitled to hear from them, we're entitled to know exactly what they're thinking at every single moment, and they should be able to predict to us what they're gonna do in every meeting. In reality, it's only been this way for less than 15 years. And that's pretty shocking when you think about what in the world did markets do with this information back in the 90s, back in the 80s? So we're actually in a better position now to be able to predict what might happen with monetary policy, what might happen with interest rates than we ever have been before. So the Fed obviously holds its regular press conferences. They don't hold a press conference after every single meeting, but they hold four press conferences per year. And then I think they communicate with us pretty often. You'd actually find people that tell you they communicate with us too much and that there's too much transparency behind it because it causes a lot of reaction in the markets. The other thing that's important to point out about this chart that you don't actually see on this chart, but I'll tell you, is that that part, uh, the line where it says Fed holds first ever post-meeting press conference, if you do a study of inflation and you look at CPI inflation, for example, and you study the volatility of that number. So the volatility, so the, the rate by which that number kind of bounces around, the volatility of inflation, of the actual inflation readings, drops tremendously right around the late 90s and then continues to go down into the 2000s and into the 2010s. That is no accident. The volatility of that falls because we started to get more information, not only about what the Fed wanted inflation to be, so we understood that it was about 2%, but then we started to get more information about what they were going to do about it if it wasn't 2%. So what it's done over time is really limit the amount of economic volatility that we've felt, especially as it relates to inflation. And I think that's also something that's important to remember. And as scary as this time feels and as uncertain as this time feels, this is much more certain than we used to be as an economy. Okay, um, for anybody who doesn't know the difference between these two, we hear a number of different inflation measures. Uh, most often we talk about CPI, so that's the one that's about 8.9% right now, and that's the one that gets the most news coverage when it comes out. Uh, that stands for consumer price index. That's something that is a basket of goods, typically a pretty static basket of goods, and that's measured every month. How much has the price of that basket changed each month? And that's the measure that we get. It's a year-over-year -year measure that we usually talk about. So March of this year compared to March of last year. And then there's core PCE inflation. So PCE stands for personal consumption expenditures. The core in front of it means that it removes food and energy. So core takes out those components of food and energy. Headline means that food and energy is still in it. So when we're looking at headline CPI versus core PCE, you're going to see a much less volatile data series in the core measure, which is that magenta line, versus the blue line, which includes things like food and energy. You might ask, why is that? Why do they take it out? Because I spend money on food and energy every single day. Uh, it is frustrating to think about it that way because as a consumer, food and energy prices certainly affect us probably more so than any other items in the basket because those are pretty non-negotiable spending items. But the reason they take it out 
is because food and energy prices also tend to be pretty volatile and they're dependent on external factors. So food, for example, may be pretty dependent on weather patterns. If you have an agricultural part of the world that grows a lot of corn, for example, I'm from the Midwest, so I'm gonna use corn as an example. If there was a terrible drought that happened in the Midwest and the corn crop was down 50% that year because of it, or maybe there was some sort of infestation that occurred, right? Completely external environmental factors that occur that then affect the price of that particular commodity. So then the price of corn is probably up quite a bit that year, but it's not up based on a market factor. So the other thing that you also have to think about as consumers is, let's say you were a big corn consumer, uh, you likely change your consumption pattern if corn becomes something that you can't afford anymore. So maybe you were buying a lot of corn, maybe you change it, now you buy a lot of peas. I, I don't know if that's the substitute <laughs> for corn, but you understand the genesis and, and really how this would morph into a substitution effect. But what we're facing right now, what you can see all the way on the end of this page is obviously CPI, which is what hits the consumer more hard, is quite a bit above that core measure because food and energy prices have been pretty much off the charts for the last few months. So the concern here, number one, is that the consumer is almost 70% of the American economy. So what the consumer does, what the consumer spends on, what the consumer consumes drives almost 70% of our GDP number. If the consumer is feeling the pain of inflation, they're naturally gonna pull back on their spending in other places, which could affect our economic growth prospects which is a big reason why the Fed is targeting this, a big reason why the Fed is going after it with a heavy hammer, because they don't want it to affect the consumer to a point where we end up in what I would consider a sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Where we're buying so much stuff, but then we can't buy as much, we pull back, growth suffers, and then we end up contracting as an economy. Now, the, the sort of confusing part here is that the metric that the Fed uses for inflation is actually core PCE. So it's the magenta line, it's not the blue line. So the Fed is watching that. Doesn't really matter at this point because that number is still well above 2%, but always keep that in mind that the number that we talk about in the news is not even the measure that the Fed watches most closely. The Fed is watching core PCE. It's measured a little bit differently and it does remove food and energy from the equation. Okay, so then I wanted to decompose inflation a little bit for everybody and just talk about what's driven it so far. And, and these are all very long-term charts, as you can see, um, but what's driven it so far, so we've got the core measure of CPI. So again, remember that that's taking food and energy out. We've got the core measure and that's the black line, or maybe it's a very navy blue. And then we've got goods in the blue line and services in the magenta line or purple line, okay? That blue line, if you heard anything about supply chain issues, that blue line and the way that it shot up at, in 2021 and has stayed so high is much because of the supply chain issues and all the pent up demand that we created in 2020 in lockdown. So the imbalances between demand and supply and the desire as consumers to continue to buy stuff that wasn't as available made that goods inflation number absolutely skyrocket. Very simply, the definition of inflation is more money chasing fewer goods. We had both of those things for all of 2021 and we continue to have that in 2022. So you're seeing that goods number shoot up. Now, the reason I wanted to decompose these is because as the US economy, we are the most developed economy in the world. Generally, as economies develop and become more mature, more of the economy is driven by services than by goods. So this was an imbalance in the economy that we couldn't fix until we actually reopened it because we weren't taking part in the services. So then we started to reopen the economy and that's where you see that purple line start to shoot up as well. If the blue line, you see that very, that very top bit where it rolled over and it started to come back down, that might be a situation where we hit peak inflation and now we're on our way down, which would be great. I think we would all cheer for that situation. The purple line has not done that yet. <laughs> so there are parts of it that we're still watching and we need to make sure that we can actually declare a peak. The other piece is 
goods inflation is not as sticky as services inflation. Services inflation tends to stick around for a longer period of time. The other point that I would make on this slide is you've probably heard quite a bit about passing through inflation to consumers. So if you're a company that's producing goods, you either have a choice of taking the higher cost of those goods and eating it, meaning it probably bites into your profit margin, or you can pass through that higher cost onto consumers in the end product. Once you pass that cost through, it's pretty permanent. So think about just very general example. This is what you'd always hear in, in business school, a company called Acme that makes widgets, okay? So Acme com company makes its widgets. The cost of those widgets has gone up. It decides to pass that through to the consumer and the price of said widget also goes up. If the economy changes and the cost of its goods goes down, they're not gonna automatically take the end product price down because they're making more money on it, right? All it does is expand their profit margin if they leave that price high and their input cost falls. So once the prices have been passed through to consumers, they stay much more sticky and even permanent until the business cycle rolls over. Okay, more ways to look at inflation, more ways to break it down and especially over time. This is again, we're looking at goods in blue, services in purple, but we added back food and energy here. So you can see the goods and services components obviously are driving more than half of the inflation number, but they're usually driving more than half of the inflation number. Now to my point on the earlier slide, remember how I said goods inflation uh, in a very developed economy, goods is less than services typically. That has not been the case recently. And look over history, if you look at that purple services component, that has usually been the majority of our inflation. Lately, that is not the case. Obviously, goods is driving this more, and then the food and energy components are driving this even more. Now, I mentioned this earlier too, food and energy are not negotiable items. If you're a consumer, you still have to eat, you still have to drive your car to work. I heard somebody say once, you can't shorten the distance between home and work. So just because gas is more expensive doesn't mean that you have to, you're gonna drive a shorter distance. You still gotta get there. And this is something that hasn't quite reared its ugly head yet in spending, but I'm a little fearful that it will start to if we don't see these numbers come down over the next few months. Okay, so I wanted to shift into some of the market effects as well of this. And you may hear things, you've probably heard things like, um, we just came out of a four decade long bond rally. And scratch your head about how in the world is that possible. The chart on the left hand side of the page is showing you what that means and, and why people say that. So that's, this is just the 10 year treasury yield. If you look back at 1982, which was a spike, which was also the last time inflation was this high, um, the spike in the, the 10 year US treasury yield. And then over that long term period, although there were little bumps in there and there were times when it came down, it went back up and, and so on and so forth, you see little peaks and valleys throughout that time frame. But the general trend has been down, which means that bond prices general trend has been up. OK, so we legitimately just finished possibly a 40 year bull market in bonds. The reason that people care about that and the reason that that was a scary proposition for a lot of investors was because the idea of a 60-40 portfolio, which would be 60% equities, 40% bonds, was that if bonds had just gone through such a long bull market, how could they possibly protect? Because pr that means that prices were so high. How could they possibly protect in an equity drawdown? We saw the unfortunate consequences of that in the first quarter of this year. And what I mean by that is the stock market went down and the bond market went down. So diversification in a traditional 60-40 portfolio did not work. And that was sort of the battle cry for a very long time from a lot of market pundits, from a lot of people that maybe had traditionally preached the benefits of diversification, but that we were heading into a period where it wasn't going to work the way that we wanted it to. So that's how we got there. That was that four decade long bull market in bonds. Why did that happen? It happened, I'm not going to go all the way back to the slide, but if you remember back to the history of inflation and all the different things that the Fed started to do, the bond market knew that. 
The bond market knew what the Fed's inflation target was. The bond market knew that maybe rates were going to stay low for a certain amount of time. And over time, over that long-term period, as we had more transparency, we had better expectations for what inflation would be. We had less volatility around inflation. Bonds were a decent investment. If you could get a bond, I mean, just look at some of the points on this chart. Back in the late 90s, you could get a 10-year treasury that was paying somewhere between 6 and 8%. That was a pretty good investment, especially if you thought that the Fed was going to target 2% inflation. So bonds ended up doing really well for investors from a price perspective. And now we're in a period where they've obviously corrected quite a bit, especially in the first quarter of this year, uh, and are back at yield levels that we haven't seen in a very long time. Okay, so then we look at the right side of this page, and the reason that I wanted to show this, this is the, the spread between the two-year and the 10-year treasury. So the yield of the two-year treasury versus the yield of the 10-year treasury. The reason I wanted to show this is a much shorter time frame. so we're only looking back to the beginning of the pandemic through today, is because it shows you that brief inversion, that time when the peachy line goes below zero and then pops back up. That's when the yield curve inverted between twos and tens. The blue line on that chart shows you when the Fed at the end of November of last year basically retired the word transitory. They had been saying for a very long time that inflation was transitory. It was, it was gonna figure itself out. It didn't need uh, a ton of monetary policy intervention. And then at the end of November of last year, they said, you know what? It's not transitory anymore. And uh, it may require some active participation by the Fed to control it and bring it down. And then as we all know, in January, the war between Russia and Ukraine began and upset the energy market and the food market that much more. Uh, so inflation was continually driven higher. So what happened uh, earlier this year was that the twos tens inverted, meaning that the two-year treasury yield was higher than the 10-year treasury yield. You might ask why it matters. It matters because it's typically a signal of recession. And I, I'm not saying that to be dramatic. <laughs> It's just that an inversion of the treasury curve typically precedes a recession. So it did send warning bells throughout the market, and it did increase the nervousness of many investors. It was a very brief inversion. I'd like to point that out. It was very brief, and it was very shallow. Uh, so it wasn't necessarily a very clear signal of a coming recession. I would say it was a more clear signal that the market was not sure what to expect based on inflation, and it was not sure what to expect from the Fed. And then the Fed started to communicate with us much more clearly and say, uh, basically, we're going to raise by 25 basis points in the March meeting. Now we're, we've gotten a decent indication that they're gonna raise by 50 points in this May meeting. So we uninverted and we're kind of bopping around in that 20 basis point spread range. But I just wanted to show the movement, um, which was, quite remarkable, the movement in that spread, even just since the beginning of the pandemic. So the bond market has been very volatile over this period, which is not usually how the bond market acts. So these are uncharted waters. These are times that we haven't seen in many, many years. And if you feel challenged as an investor or as a lender or as a borrower, it is very natural to feel challenged. We all are looking at this, uh, this type of environment really for the first time. Okay, so I've mentioned a few times we're expecting the Fed to hike by 50 basis points tomorrow or announce that they were hiking by 50 basis points tomorrow, but this is the full year of expectations that we're seeing right now. So this is basically what the market is telling us to expect as far as Fed rate hikes go. So looking at where we are today, and these are this is just the upper bound of their range. So today we're sitting at 50 basis points. We hike by 50 in May, and that would take us to 1% uh, as the upper bound. Right now, the market is expecting a 75 basis point hike in June, which would be large. Uh, I will be very surprised by that. I will be very surprised. I, I'll never say never, um, but I will be very surprised if that occurs, a 75 basis point hike, especially because then the next one that the market is expecting is only 50. And messaging when you're the Federal Reserve is very important. I fear that if they hiked by 50 and then by 75 and then went back down to 50, it would be a confusing message for the market and for consumers and for the economy to digest. So I think it's probably more likely 
that they go steady. Maybe they do 50 basis points all three times, but it's more likely that they're steady with it than to do this sort of big hike and then back down to a smaller hike. But as you can see, as we get to December, the upper bound is actually expected to be 3% now. Um, the reason that that is the expectation is because if you look at inflation expectations or inflation break evens, which is the way that we measure those expectations, uh, the 10 year inflation expectation is still above two and a half percent. The two year and the five year is a little bit higher than that. So trying to get inflation under control is the primary mandate right now. I think that there's a decent chance that inflation moderates or starts to cool off as we get further into summer. And it's possible at that point that if inflation starts to moderate and cool off, the Fed has done a number of rate hikes already, that maybe they can make what would be considered a slight dovish pivot and message that, okay, hikes are working, inflation is moderating, it's not as catastrophic as we thought it was earlier in the year. We're happy with the way things are working. We've used a couple of our other tools to control inflation, uh, and we maybe are going to take our, our foot off of the hiking pedal slightly. That would typically be uh, received well by the stock market. So I think that that's something to watch for mid to late summer in their narrative. Also, pay attention to the dates uh, along the bottom. So we've got a meeting in May, we've got a meeting in June, one in July, we skip August, okay? So there's a pretty big gap between that end of July meeting and then not another meeting where we'll hear from the Fed until almost the end of September. And that's when markets tend to get kind of jittery. So what happened in March, we had a meeting mid-March and we heard from the Fed then, and then we had to go all the way until tomorrow to hear from them again in an official way. and we experienced April, which was the worst month since 2008, in the middle of that. So the market does not like those long time periods of waiting. Also, I would keep in mind that we have a midterm election that's coming up in November. Markets typically are jittery ahead of a midterm election, and then there's relief afterwards. That would also tell you the anticipation of these events is typically worse than the event itself. So. I would not be surprised with some more volatility late summer, early fall as we approach midterms. I also would not be surprised with a relief rally after the midterm is over. Okay, and then since this is a event for financial aid officers, uh, I think an important thing to look at is not just the Fed funds rate. Um, and if, in case anybody doesn't know, I wanna make sure that this is clear too, what the Fed funds rate even is. The Fed funds rate is the rate that the Federal Reserve sets and suggests that banks borrow and lend money to each other at in the overnight market. Okay, so big banks go borrow and lend money to each other because they have to meet certain reserve requirements, also set by the Federal Reserve. They have to meet those reserve requirements. The suggestion is that this is the rate that they should do it at. That's the Fed funds rate. The prime rate usually is about 300 basis points or 3% above the Fed funds rate. The prime rate is what banks use for consumer lending. So that's a benchmark rate that banks give consumer loans out at. So right now we're at 0.5% upper bound. The prime rate then is at 3.5%, okay? That prime rate though is for the most qualified, least risky borrower. Chances are, depending on the loan type, so let's say it's an auto loan, or let's say it's a personal loan, which is a little bit riskier of a loan type just in general. The, there's going to be a spread between the prime rate and what the consumer is actually paying. So let's say they have decent credit, but not perfect credit. They might end up paying prime, which is three and a half percent plus 150 basis points. So they might have a 5% quote on that loan. So always keep that in mind too. Prime rate does not necessarily mean the rate at which somebody's going to get on a particular type of loan. But if we go back to this expectation, if the Fed funds rate ends up being 3% by the end of this year, that means prime is at 6%. And thinking about especially student loans, this is a really important point. Let's make an assumption again that student loan borrowers who went to school in the last five to 10 years, let's say they've got student loans that are at 7% right now. They could refinance today and have a pretty big benefit because the prime rate is only at three and a half, okay? So that benefit, depending on how good of a borrower they are, 
they could have a pretty big spread between what they're paying in interest versus what's available. If they wait till the end of the year to refinance that student loan, it may not even make sense anymore. And they're just stuck at that higher rate. So if Prime is at 6% and they've got a student loan that's 6.5%, I don't know that it would make sense with fees to refinance that for just a 50 basis point benefit. So really right now, time is of the essence. And this is a message that we've been trying to send, especially to borrowers, because over the life of a loan and depending on the size of the loan, you can save a lot of money in interest by refinancing before all of these rate hikes go into effect. So I just want people to really keep that in mind. All right. Another thing that uh, we talk about, aside from the personal loan industry, student loans, auto loans, all that kind of thing, obviously is mortgage loans. Uh, I, I don't think it's lost on anybody that we have home prices at all time highs. We just got another reading last week of the home price index and it was actually higher than the previous month. I thought it was maybe gonna go down, but it did not. It went from 19 to above 20% growth. So home prices at all time highs. And we've got rates on the rise. Now, you can either be somebody who already has a mortgage. I would hope that if you did have a mortgage that is older, you've probably already refinanced. And there's some studies that have been done on that. Most people did refinance in the period where rates were low, and that's great. They saved themselves a lot of money. Now, if you're a new borrower, again, time is of the essence because rates are rising. Mortgage rates, however, tend to track the 10-year treasury closer than the Fed funds rate. Mortgage rates are pretty volatile. Uh, they move around more than, let's say, student loan rates. And when you look at the measurement of mortgage rates, they tend to track the US Treasury closer. So that's why on the right hand side of this slide, you're looking at the 10 year Treasury yield, and then mortgage activity. So the Treasury yield is in magenta. And as you saw it go down, you saw mortgage activity go up. That was in 2020. Everybody was buying houses, everybody was leaving cities getting bigger homes or selling the one that they were in for whatever reason. And then as you see the 10 year shoot up, knowing that mortgage rates track that pretty closely, you see mortgage activity has gone down quite a bit. So the affordability of homes is going down twofold. It's going down not only because rates are rising, but also because home prices are at all time highs. So this is something that, you know, we're not in a, in a situation like we were in 2006, 2007, where there was this big real estate bubble or over leverage that had happened. But I do think what's gonna happen as we go through the rest of this year is because the affordability of homes and mortgage affordability is going to fall down, there's just gonna be less activity. So I would also expect a cooling off in home prices. And this ends up being a really tricky question. So if people ask you right now, is this a good time to buy a house? Frankly, from an interest rate perspective, this is better than the end of the year. But from a home price perspective, it may not be the best time to buy a house. So if you're forced to buy a house because of lifestyle reasons or whatever has happened, then sooner rather than later is better because you're going to get a better rate. If you have the flexibility to wait, it might be smart to wait. Okay, and then the last thing that I wanted to show everybody, and this is just a basic chart that uh, we looked at, we created this last week in a weekly blog post of mine so that I could just illustrate this point. When markets are volatile and when we're in a period, like I've pointed out, that is uncharted waters for all of us, it's really easy to get fixated on the short term. It's really easy to get fixated on uh, what's happened in our investment portfolio or what's happened to the rates that we thought we were gonna have over a very short term period, let's say in the span of 30 days or less. But you still have to remember what the long term looks like. So a lot of times when we talk about long term, if you read an investment textbook or a statistics book, a long term average doesn't count as long term until it's at least 10 years and preferably 15 years. The longer, the better, right? The longer, the better, the more stable the data series is. Realistically, I completely understand that there aren't many people out there that are gonna wait around 10 years to be right. So I looked at five-year periods instead and figured the average investor or the average consumer has at least a five-year time horizon. So then we look at distribution of annual returns on the S&P 500 
over rolling five-year periods. And we did this daily. We took literally daily observations going back to 1950. We had over 18,000 observations. So this is a robust data set. And then all I wanted to know was if you took every single rolling five-year period, how many of them were below zero? And it turns out only 7% of the time were your investment returns on the S&P below zero. And in fact, the most likely outcome was that you had an annualized return. So that's each year, you had an annualized return of 10 to 15%. Now, obviously that's not necessarily how it's gonna happen in the future. There's clearly a distribution here, but there are even some occurrences above 25% return. And what I would say about this chart, this is why this one is important, is that this time period included 11 recessions. It included multiple periods, I believe seven, where inflation was above 5%. It included multiple periods where the Fed was, rising, was raising rates. So a lot of the factors that we're dealing with right now as headwinds are also included in this sample set and also included in an investor's experience over that time period. So it's not the end of the world. It's not something that isn't gonna change. It's not a permanent situation. It's not a forever situation, but it is the situation that we're faced with right now and it does make decisions uh, much more important and you have to be much more careful about your decisions as a consumer and as an investor. Okay, that is the end. Um, I think I am gonna stop sharing at this point and take a look at some questions. Oh, I've answered one of them, that's great. Um, how much does oh that's that one the supply chain affect inflation yet we talked about that already you know what i can expand on that just a little bit too because i think it's important so there were a couple different areas of the economy that were affected more so by the supply chain than others so we heard a lot about semiconductors being uh, a big issue semiconductors are, are just those little chips that go into a lot of different products um, i don't think any of us realized how much the auto industry was dependent on semiconductors before this, but everybody wanted a car and semiconductors were not available and workers to build the cars also were not available. And used car prices ended up skyrocketing above new car prices, which was entirely bizarre to me. Why would you buy an older car for more money than you could buy a brand new one? But it happened. And I'm sure we all have stories of people in our lives. I, my cousin and her husband traveled far and wide, uh, I believe to Pennsylvania from Wisconsin to get a car. Um, and I mean, there are people that were taking flights to go pick up a car and then drive it home. So the shortage of some of those goods was amazing. And the fact that we had all of this pent up demand, I don't think any of us had experienced that before. We were locked in our houses for such a long time that the first opportunity we had to get out of our houses and the way that we had to do that, which was to buy a car or get on a plane or whatever it may be, we wanted to, to do it. We chomped at the bit and the demand of it just never really subsided until just recently where the supply chain started to catch up and you saw used car prices not be such a big component of overall inflation. So when we study somebody like me or, or on my team, when we study inflation, we look at the inflation readings that we get each month what I want to see is that some of those components that were the biggest uh, offenders, so to speak, I want to see those relax and used car prices have started to roll over and that's a good thing. Um, I'd like to see food prices do the same, energy prices obviously, and those are important too. Housing is a difficult thing to measure in inflation, so it's not directly in the reading, but you do want to see some of those, those bigger offenders roll over. Okay, next question. Housing prices and building materials are soaring. Help us understand the impact on this market with a rising rate market. Okay, so um, again, a lot of that is supply chain related and it's labor related. So clearly the demand for housing, for new houses, for existing houses uh, increased during the pandemic. I live in Manhattan. I witnessed it firsthand. People just flooding out of the city, moving to the suburbs. Um, or even people buying larger places in the city. So the demand for purchasing was huge. As the demand for purchasing rose and the inventory of homes on the market did not necessarily rise the same amount, 
then you had, again, more money chasing fewer goods. It works the same way in the housing market. So then you think, okay, then we just have to build more houses. Absolutely. And we measure that too in the economy. We look at building permits, right? Because you have to get a permit before you actually build the house. Building permits took off during the pandemic. The problem was, if you're going to build a house, you need lumber, you need copper, you need a lot of different materials. The supply chains uh, slowed that down, slowed down the delivery of materials. You need bathtubs to be delivered. I mean, everything. Just think about all the different things that go into building a house, the fixtures, the finishings, the furniture. I, I, it took, I think it took me three months to get a coffee table during the pandemic. So all of those things were slowed down, not to mention the labor was just not available. And even if some of the materials were there at the site, you might not have had the labor available to actually build the house. So the longer that took and the bigger the gap between the people that wanted a house and the number of houses available, home prices just continued to go up. Um, the stories are still going on where you hear people being outbid, overbid, uh, all cash offers, that continues. So it hasn't relaxed yet. This is gonna be probably a regional phenomenon where, uh, as I mentioned, I'm in Manhattan. There are a lot of people here that buy apartments with cash. So mortgage rates don't matter. And the home prices in cities like this or in places where you have a lot of all cash offers are gonna be less affected by rising mortgage rates. And it's gonna take a longer period of time for home prices and those to come down. But that's actually an interesting thing if anybody wants to look into and you want like extra credit or something, you can look at the different measures of home prices. So you can do a national home price index, which includes as many metropolitan areas as possible. And then you can do a 20 city one, which is just the large cities. You can usually do it um, by regions. So you could look at the West versus the South versus the Northeast. You can look at just specific cities. And that's where we're gonna to start to see the regional differences uh, because of the forces that I just mentioned. Uh, okay, do housing mortgages go hand in hand with Fed funds rate? Okay, so I, and I, I answered this a little bit. Um, the answer is no. There's going to be a correlation. So there is a relationship for any lending, any consumer lending product, there's going to be a relationship uh, between the Fed funds rate and whatever the rate is on that product because prime, uh, the prime rate is typically what banks use as the benchmark. Mortgages, however, do track more closely with the 10-year treasury yield. So as the treasury yield rises, which usually the treasury yield does rise when the Fed funds rate rises. So there's a relationship between it all. But if you're looking at something that's a little bit more of a benchmark for mortgage rates, look at the 10-year treasury yield. Okay, I think I got them all. Um, yeah, there was one in the comments, but I think we got that one. So. I think we're good. Yeah, thank you, Liz. That was so great. And I was sitting here wanting to buy a house and do all this. So thank you. <laughs> um, if one last call. Um, we do have a little bit of time. Does anyone have any pending questions? I'll give like a couple, like a minute or so. Oh, looks like we have one other question, Liz. Um, if I like see it, to. yep. Is the delay in decision by President Biden for students returning to repayment costing students a great opportunity to refinance their loans. Um, okay, it, this is, it's tricky to answer because it's more of like a if, if then statement. You don't have to wait to refinance. And that's the thing. Now, nobody knows when the student loan moratorium is going to be lifted. It could be August, it could be the end of the year. Um, let's just be conservative about it and assume end of the year. Let's assume that it's still in place through the end of the year. That chart that I showed you before about where the prime rate might be if those Fed hikes actually occur, the prime rate would be somewhere close to 6%. Now, depending on where somebody's student loan rate is right now, they might miss the opportunity to refinance if they wait until the end of the year. Now, if you have a federal loan and you're under CARES protection, it's true you don't have to be making payments. The financially uh, responsible thing to be doing if you are if you're able to make payments is that right now you can literally just pay down your principal you don't have to pay interest so pay down the principal while you're sheltered from interest payments but you don't have to wait to refinance until the payments go back into effect it's true that if you refinanced right now and it's a federal loan and you refinanced it into a, a private loan you would have to start paying immediately it would it would force you into repayment the reality of it is you're going to have to pay it anyway. 
And it's just a matter of when your start date is. So when you restart those payments, all you'd be doing is pushing the same principal payment back, right? If you wanted to take advantage of the rates where they are right now, yes, you'd have to go into repayment, but you'd probably have a bigger interest benefit by refinancing now than waiting until the moratorium is lifted. Oh, there's one more in here. You guys just keep trickling in. I love it. After the forthcoming interest hikes, when do you think they'll come back down? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I can't predict that. And I wish that I had a crystal ball that told me that. Um, I did mention, I do think there's a possibility that inflation starts to moderate in summer. As I said, we're, we're seeing some of the components come down, used car prices, for example. Um, I'd like to see energy prices come down further, food prices, obviously, all the stuff that hits the consumer. And if inflation comes down and the Fed feels like some aggressive hikes up front were effective, then you might see them slow down with the hikes. What that would do is probably support a little bit of a relief in the equity market. Uh, it could make bond yields moderate. Now, when will they cut rates? Chances are they won't cut rates unless we're in a dire economic situation. So they're probably not cutting rates unless they fear that we're going into a recession or until they find out that we're in a recession. Um, the predictor of recession, you know, right now, if you look out 12 months, I believe the last time we checked, I think the probability that every, the consensus probability of recession in the next 12 months is only about 25%. Now, what is it in the next 18 months? probably a little bit higher. Um, but again, the reality of that is it's, I think it's always important. We use the word recession as if it's some kind of Armageddon. Recessions are a natural part of the business cycle. They shake the excess out of the environment. They shake the excess out of the economy and they don't have to be terribly detrimental and long lasting. We've certainly survived a few that have been terribly detrimental and long lasting, but they're not all like that. So there is a chance that we go into a brief and shallow recession that shakes some of the inflation issue out of the equation. That would be okay. Uh, if it's brief and shallow enough, it may not break the labor market terribly. It may not break corporations terribly. So there are possibilities for a recession that isn't an Armageddon situation or isn't caused by some huge external shock. Uh, they, again, they are a natural part of the business cycle and I don't think that they're necessarily something to terribly fear all the time. Okay, now I think I got them all. Thank you for your questions. I love questions. Well, thank you everyone. Again, Liz, thank you so much um, for this insightful call. Um, and again, uh, everyone have a great day and we will send you an email of this recording. If you have any additional questions or anything, always feel free to reach out, but thank you again for joining. Thank you.